Tonight, a panel of leaders discuss power, expectations and leadership under siege. Dylan Olcott, our Australian of the Year, is here, ready to spell out his vision. It's great to be back. Welcome to Q&A in 2022. Coming to you live from Melbourne tonight with a great studio audience. Joining me on the panel, family violence campaigner and 2015 Australian of the Year, Rosie Batty. Liberal member for Higgins, Katie Allen, who's been up half the night crossing the floor. Sporting icon and Australian of the Year, Dylan Alcott. And joining us live from Sydney, co-chair of the Indigenous Voice, Tom Kelmer. And Shadow Minister for Education and Women, Tanya Plibersek, who's in isolation at home and also had a very late finish last night as well. Great to have you all here. Thanks for being here. <laughs> and remember, you can stream us live on iView and our social channels. Quanda is the hashtag. So join in the conversation and we publish your comments on screen from all the socials. Our first question tonight comes from Ainaru August. Hi, everyone. There's been a lot of criticism of Grace Tame for not being gracious with Scott Morrison and for sharing some of the power tactics people tried to exercise over her during her year as Australian of the Year. Should the Australian of the Year be bold and fearless in the eye of criticism, or should they shrink to the back and nod their head even to the most powerful in the land? Is it about speaking the truth or speaking what others want you to say? What does the panel think? Where does this place you, Dylan, as you start your Australian of the Year? How do you look to start? With a clean pair of aces or some foul shots? <laughs> nice sport reference, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for your question, I appreciate it as well. Um, first and foremost, uh, I love that Grace is Grace. She's really proud of the person that she is and um, to be honest, she's been through a lot as well. And uh, I was really proud watching yesterday both her and Brittany speak, first and foremost, because they've been through a huge trauma in their life that is really hard to always bring up. And, like, you know, I can't begin to think what they've been through. But, or, you know, I've been discriminated against. I did get bullied as a kid. And when I have to talk about those things, it can be really hard. And to be that vulnerable um, has to be, first and foremost, respected, but listened to. And that's something that, you're like, I don't know Brittany, but I do know Grace. And I'm really proud and lucky to call her a maid. And I think she's done an amazing job as Australian of the Year. If I could be one-eighth the Australian of the Year that she's done, I think I would have done my job. Um, what I will say is the way that I'm going to do it is I'm just going to be me. I don't know how to be anybody else. And I used to pretend I was someone else growing up. I hated myself. I hated my disability. I wanted to be like my brother who wasn't in a wheelchair. And then I actually just started embracing my disability and being myself. Um, and... Mate, I'm so bloody honoured to be Australian of the Year. I still can't believe it. Like, I don't... Like, I honestly can't. Like, Sydney with Rosie Batty, like, she's a queen to me. Like, and, you know, and just, just incredible. And, um, you know, what I will say is I'm going to speak my truth too and, 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 you know, whether that's to power or to anybody in the way that I do it. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity. And to be honest, I can't do anything myself. It's a team effort. It's all of us. It's a we. And... I can't wait to amplify the voices of other people with disabilities as well. And Dylan, does that mean then, from time to time, going to the spirit of the question, uh, being a difficult presence, being an argumentative, uncomfortable presence, is that part of being you and part of doing this role? A thousand percent. Uh, if, if, you know, people disrespect or don't support my community, which is people with disabilities, of course I'm going to stick up for them and do what I need to do. And um, to be honest... I didn't need Australian of the Year to do that. <laughs> I've always done that. And no, that's true. I am pretty honoured that I, that I did get it. And, um, you know, I just want to hopefully make everybody proud in what I can do this year. Rosie, I want to turn to you. Brittany um, Higgins paid homage to you in her speech. I just wonder how that felt and, and how it's felt for you as a former Australian of the Year, watching Grace Tame do it in a very different way to you. Look, it's, um, I was very honoured and, and um, I have met with Grace as well and it's really great that they acknowledge that there are women who've gone before that have made it possible for them to have a voice, as women have gone before me. Um, yes, I did it differently to Grace, but I was also, also very fearless and very forthright. Um, there was a different government, different leadership, different prime ministers. I spent my time backwards and forwards in Canberra um, 
working on legislative change, working on funding cuts, working on, on um, in, with, 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 in varying ways to amplify the voices of victims of family violence. Um, it was an incredible honour, and I have sat with some discomfort in quite frank, you know, being honest. I haven't always understood why I've been uncomfortable. Um, I think it's a really interesting... Uncomfortable at? Um, some of... Um, some of the... Um, some, some of... The, maybe some of the Grace's approach. And it's her, not... Her, her anger, her evident anger. Um, I'm not sure whether it's anger or passion or forthrightness, but that doesn't mean that it's a criticism. It means I'm acknowledging I'm not sure about this. And yeah, as Grace said, as um, Dylan said, he will do it his way. The most important thing is she has authenticity and she's doing it her way. I did it with authenticity, I did it my way. Advocacy is in many different forms with many different approaches. There is not one way fits all and there is not one approach that works. And so it's ultimately what Grace and Brittany have been able to do is really invigorate feminism and role modelling for young women. Before I move on to the rest of the panel, you, you did uh, say publicly, you, you uh, were quoted publicly, uh, uncomfortable with the way that Grace Tame behaved at the Australian of the Day, the Australian of the Year Next Award, and where she gave the Prime Minister that epic side eye. Have you and Grace Tame made contact since, and have you discussed that with her? Um, we did talk about something which was not that particular event, but certainly I think she held me up as a really great role model and she was really quite hurt. Um, I felt my article was really quite balanced because it's actually full of admiration. But sometimes I'm not... I, that isn't the way that I would have done it, but that doesn't mean to say that she did the wrong thing. And, I, and it is, it, you know, why, why should we all agree if we don't agree? And I guess what I felt was, I've been on the strain of the year. I understood, I think it is a great honor. I wouldn't have thought to do that. However, look at what she's been able to do because she did do that. So I can reserve the right to rethink how I felt. I can reserve the right to go, well, you know what? Maybe I was wrong because there's a hell of a lot of people think she was right. And so, yeah. I can be brave enough to say, I'm not sure, but just because I may not have done it that way doesn't mean to say it wasn't the right thing to do. Tom Kalman, can I get you to join in? Because I could see that you were responding uh, quite vocally to that. What are you thinking? Uh, yeah, look, I, I um, don't have an issue with the way that uh, she behaved. And I think what the audience and, and Australia needs to understand is that um, whilst the Prime Minister uh, bestows the award, uh, they don't have the government, the Commonwealth government, doesn't have a, a say over who gets appointed. And there's a very rigorous process. And I've been chair in the ACT on, on the, um, the panels down there. And the process is very rigorous and is standardised across Australia. And I think um, anybody who gets to be a finalist is well and truly deserving, yeah. as are all the other nominees. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, and it's important that, that they're able to uh, behave and, and, and continually practice what they, what they were doing prior to coming, um, coming in onto the national uh, platform, uh, which is important. We don't want people to, to change their behaviour um, uh, and their, their advocacy and their interests mm. uh, just because they're, uh, you know, they've got the national award. Well, well, and I say go for it. Well, then maybe something has changed because I think up until recent years, maybe we as a community have regarded the Australian of the Year as a, a lovely honour and a titular thing and now go out and, and have a lovely year and, and say nice things about your area of interest. It's, it's a platform now and it's a platform now for powerful change and uncomfortable change, is it, Tom? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and look, it's so important for, um, you know, governments of all persuasions, uh, both at the, the central level and the, the state and territory level, to hear what, um, you know, people uh, like the Australian of the Year have to say because they also go on a tour, they hear a lot of people um, and what their views are, which uh, either support or, or oppose their view. And so they become a vehicle to be able to get the community's, um, you know, interest uh, fed back into the parliament. So I think they, you know, the, the government should, should feel privileged that they're able to have people like the Australians of the Year uh, providing very candid and... Um, and direct advice to them. I'm going to start taking notes. This is good stuff. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Ian, keep us up all night, all we're right? Go, we're going to get Tom to give you a whole lot of notes oh, tonight. Good. This is, give it as a nominee. He'll be able to help you out there. Tanya Plibersek, can I bring you in here? First of all, your, your response to those uh, really incendiary speeches by Brittany Higgins and, and Grace Tame and to the heart of the question about being a bit of a rat bag if you have that role. Well, I think the two speeches at the press club this week were absolutely brilliant and I'm so impressed by and proud of this generation of young women who are leading big change in Australia. And here's the thing about Australian of the Year. I really do wish we were talking as much now about child sexual abuse as we are about um, Grace Tame giving the Prime Minister side eye because the reason Grace Tame was asked to be Australian of the Year the same way uh, Rosie was asked to be Australian of the Year, um, same way Dylan was asked to be the Australian of the Year, is because they are leading big social change. And big social change doesn't come easily. It comes after a lot of hard work, and sometimes that means ruffling some feathers along the way. And we can't ask these incredible change makers to become Australian of the Year and then just sit quietly for a year and not continue um, their their work, their passion uh, to change Australia for the better. So, look, you know, it's a tough gig. Um, you, you walk in quite often without a lot of uh, experience of being on TV or representing the country and you're, up, you're thrown into it at the deep mm. end. So I think, um, I think Grace Tame has done a fantastic job. I'm so, I'm so impressed by her. I'm so proud to call... Rosie and Dylan, my friends, I'm so impressed by the work they've did, done and, and the way they have used their platforms in the past and I hope it continues. It's such a, a different way of doing business as a, a female leader, the, the way that Grace Tame has done it yeah. and Brittany Higgins has done it. Uh, Tanya Plibersek, if you add up all your years in politics and all the stuff that you must have walked past from time to time or been horrified by or even called out at the time... Does it make you wish that you'd done things differently, that you'd channelled some of that rage, that evident anger that we see now from Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins? You know, I, I've, I've got a daughter who's in her early 20s and I do feel such sadness and shame that we haven't fixed it for this generation of young women yet. Um, as Rosie said earlier, generations have worked on this problem of child sexual abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault. Um, we, have, we have worked on these problems for years and, and yet we haven't achieved what we should have as a nation. And I hope, I genuinely hope that this is an inflection point, a moment in time where we can capture the rage of so many women, the people who turned out in the March for Justice mm -hmm. uh, close to a year ago now, who marched on Parliament House. They, they were grandmothers, they were mothers, they were... They were young women and just saying enough is enough. It's time for change in this nation. And I, I really do hope we take that opportunity to make real change now. Katie Allen, um, can I ask you, is there a generational inflection going on here? Is there, is there a generational shift in the way that some younger women now are prepared to be uh, grumpy, angry, to not please, to not want to make nice, that is contrasting with perhaps our generation? Look, I absolutely think there's been a Me Too moment um, that Brittany Higgins has led um, and it's mm. arisen in Parliament. I think Me Too, the Me Too movement has sort of arisen in different sectors around the world. I think in the US it was in the arts and communication area and just happened to be in Parliament. I think that there's misogyny and sexism right across the world um, and right across Australia. But I, I feel more hopeful for women um, because I see that there's, there's definitely been generational change. And, you know, if you go back 100 years, um, you know, I had a... Uh, a, a cousin who was, you know, first UK um, minister um, in cabinet, and um, she didn't have children. She never married um, because she had to choose between a career and a family. And you, you know, we haven't had enough gains, that's for sure. But if I look to my mother's generation, they had to quit work once they got pregnant. I mean, it's completely changed in one generation. So, you know, thousands of years of human evolution, and we're looking at a social revolution in the last 30 to 50 years. And if I look at the last five to six years, it's been massive. And you now have this young generation of women who the glass ceiling has been broken well and truly, and they're getting mad about what they want to see and what they want to do. Um, but I also think there's this sort of acceptance of um, not being categorised. Like, you be you. I think that's really important. And, and young, young people don't want to be categorised. They want to be who they want to be, and they are very 
comfortable with mm. self-expression and individualism. Mm. I've got a couple of daughters um, and they kind of, they can't understand why things don't more, move more quickly, so they do get frustrated. Mm. But um, I'm a paediatrician by training and I remember seeing um, at a conference once this paragraph talking about the old generation are too slow and um, they look to the younger generation and think, how hopeless are they? The world's going to go you know, to hell in a handbasket. And it was from 300 BC. Mm. I mean, there's always generational change. That's mm. the great thing about the world. Just before I move on to our next question, um, we've heard from the government they're not going to investigate further the suggestion that, um, or the, the allegation that Grace Tame made that she was strong-armed. She was threatened by someone senior in the government-funded organisation uh, to make nice and not to say anything at the Australia Day event that would make Scott Morrison uncomfortable. Anne Rustin said this morning that she had to give details of what went on before that they could investigate further. Does that seem fair to you? I just think what happened to Grace is just not on. I mean, it's just unacceptable. So how should the government investigate that to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else? Well, and I, I think that's the difficulty, isn't it? If, if someone doesn't want to pursue it, then that's, you know, that's up to, gra uh, to Grace. Um, but, you know, it would be helpful if we did know because that sort of thing just should never happen. Do you think that the government can investigate this as best it can without relying on Grace Tame to, to give up a name? Well, um, I think... Is, is there I an think... obligation on the government to do that? Well, no, I think Anne Rustin has actually asked Grace, could you tell us, or, or even the Prime Minister has asked, well, which institution at least, because then we can make sure that we have a little sort of, please, you know, be aware this is not appropriate. So I think Grace <coughs> hasn't told us which federally funded organisation it is. Um, and it's better not to make guesses on these things. But on the other hand, I think the conversation should be pretty clear to the community is that sort of thing is just not acceptable. Tom Campbell, I'll just very quickly come to you on that, your response and then I'll move on to the next question. Yeah, look, I, I agree totally. And, and, you know, the government should take a position to to you know, publicly announce that this is just not acceptable. Anybody who wants to do things on behalf of government, they're either endorsed to do it, or if they're not, don't don't uh, put themselves up as if they're representing the government and um, you know the government of the day. And uh, yeah, just you know, I think the, the the issue for me is that you know, and media's got a role to play in this as well. The, you know, the focus on the individual rather than the issue. And it's the issues that these, both these young ladies have, have raised that, that we should be focusing on. And we are giving them attention, or the government is. Um, but, you know, let's, let's move away from the character assassinations and, and you know, the second guessing as to why okay. and, uh, and look at the issue. Let's go to our next question. It's a video one. It comes from Jen Van Acteren. People of faith already have some of the strongest protections in this country. What this bill will do is allow discrimination in the name of faith, not only towards LGBTIQ plus folk, but also women, unmarried parents, people living with a disability, people from multicultural backgrounds and people of other faiths. My question is to you, Tanya Plibersek, how could you and your party support this legislation, albeit with a few amendments, when it was possible that with the support of a few Liberals crossing the floor, you could have voted it down? That's from Jen Van uh, Acteren. Over to you, Tanya Plibersek. Well, Jen, speaking from Tasmania, which does have religious protection, uh, state-based legislation, but um, actually uh, in lots of parts of Australia, people of faith don't have any protection at all, at all. And we do think that people of faith need to have protection from discrimination and vilification, just as every Australian deserves to be protected. Uh, Jen's talking about um, women, uh, um, uh, people who are gay or lesbian. Uh, it, it is Labor that introduced the Sex Discrimination Act, the Racial Discrimination Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, because we think every Australian should be treated fairly. Every Australian should feel safe. Every Australian should be included. R right now in Sydney, if you're a, a Muslim woman sitting on a train and someone yells at you for wearing hijab, you've got no protection under the law from that. Um, it's not fair that some Australians should feel unsafe. Well, that, well uh, I'll, just, for... I'll just jump in there. I mean, there, there are assault laws, of course. So, I mean, uh, and uh, under assault yeah, laws, you know, one, one could... Someone. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, a, a verbal assault can still... You can still go to a police if you have evidence with that. But, look, I mean, the question went to, I guess, having it both ways. I mean, you, you, you made the amendments, but you let it go through. Were you trying to have it both ways with the way that you played it, rather than getting rid of this legislation altogether? 
Um, well, we would like to see protections for all Australians. Uh, we want every Australian to feel safe and included, and that does include people of faith. We've said all along that we want to see protections for people of faith from discrimination and vilification, but they should not come at the expense of any other Australian. So our amendments went to better protecting children, and I'm really pleased that Katie and a number of other Liberals joined with the crossbenchers and voted with Labor to give protection for all children. We had a number of other amendments that went to um, uh, aged care and, uh, and other, um, other pieces of the legislation. It's up to Scott Morrison now uh, to decide whether he wants to compromise and offer protection to people of faith without reducing protections to other Australians. All right, well, we, it or looks like... It's it, all too hard. It looks like the legislation's probably been shelved and certainly can't... Nothing can happen with it before we get to the election and maybe Katie Allen can illuminate us on that. What's its future now? Well, we've got... Um, you know, the Senate can't sit next week because it's in estimates and then we've got three days, which is budget week. I think there's only two sitting days for the Senate. So there's so, two so days. So that's it. So it's, it's, it's dead. Yeah. How did well, it feel? Crossing... I don't like to use those sorts of words, but yes, I mean, it's hard My to... phrase. <laughs> um, at least before the election, and, and then depended on the government uh, getting, getting government back. How did it feel crossing the floor with your colleagues uh, in defiance of your Prime Minister? He's personally very wedded to this legislation. Well, you know, I actually feel... Um, it's, it's a very interesting mix of emotions, to be fair. It's hard to ex explain it. You, because... look, you look happy. I do. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I feel like I've stood up for what I believe in. Good job. I... You, 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 your Prime Minister won't be happy with you. I mean, you're happy, but I, I've had lots of conversations with the Prime Minister and, and I suppose what I feel really thrilled about is the whole process. You know, our democracy does work. Um, and I'm there representing the people of Higgins. I mean, that's 110,000 people. But there are also other people representing other people with different views. And the contest of ideas is why I've gone to Parliament. And we've had that contest of ideas. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to have a vote. Can I, can I just add in there, you said obviously thrilled with the process. But some people who weren't thrilled were the people that got hurt by the bill to start with. I think a bill that protected some people from discrimination, but in, indirectly or directly discriminated another group, is a crap bill that needs to go in the bin the best of time. And you can see the emotion. Obviously, it's important to do, but it might not need to get to that level sometimes when you actually think about holistically how it could affect people. Dylan, tell us about that date you went on when you were 16. Yeah, so I actually went on a date when I was... Because this bill actually discriminated against people with disability because in some very, very traditional parts of, of religion, we are yeah. a spawn of Satan because our parents did something wrong or we did something wrong. And I went on a date to Ch Chad's and Stop Shopping Centre. Chatty. Killed it, went to Nando's, <laughs> nailed it. And we left and a preacher was there and started screaming at me that I was a spawn of Satan. No. And prayed for me and my date and told my date that it was a bad idea, that they were with me, because that was the religion they believed. And when I saw this bill, I was like, that actually it somewhat protects some people to talk like that. Ken's confirmed, though, successful date, somehow. So, <laughs> that's what I'm about. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe the pastor closed the deal. Oh, no, so no, no, it worked for me. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Um, but uh, back to you, Katie Allen. I mean, if the, if the Prime Minister can't get his team behind him, all his team, on a piece of legislation that is so important to him and that he's decided to make the centrepiece of just these brief few days in Parliament before an election is called, what does that say about his authority? Well, the Liberal Party, as John Howard has said, and it's been repeated many times after, is, you know, it's a broad church and uh, we are a Yeah, party. but it's a church that actually has to get done the stuff that the Prime Minister wants to get done, right? Yeah, but, I mean, there's also, um, you know, there's the, the sort of moving forward of democracy. So there has been... And, look, I take your point, Dylan, that whenever we have a conversation about really sensitive issues, um, whether it's, you know, Grace Tame talking about you know, her incredibly traumatic past, um, there will be people who will be triggered by that. And, or, you know, the, the awful things that you have had to experience. I mean, shocking, really, in modern Australia, how, how absolutely... But, but this wasn't, this wasn't triggering. This was legislation that actually enabled that as an institutionalised discrimination. That's so, a different So the thing point altogether. about discussing these things, I, I kind of am someone who believes that it's important to shine a light. And so... I think I, Dylan's point was about introducing it in the first place, wasn't it, rather than discussing it? Yeah, Rosie, but, I, but I think there are people who, who literally believe things that, in my view, 
I, I don't feel comfortable with. But there are, you know, having the conversation is important to bring Australians together. I, I think for many, it's 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 sickening that we're even having this debate. And I think it's incredibly harmful to so many. And it reminds people of the plebiscite and all of the discourse and discussion and analysing when really this is everybody should be able to be safe and accepted for exactly who they are. And, and I think what, well, as we enjoy the debate, it's incredibly damaging yep. for those who are transgender or queer or on the spectrum of diversity in whatever way, shape or form it looks like. And I think that is what's really hurtful. And, and it must be terrible to think, mm. as a side, we've gone beyond this, surely, but we know we have not. And it's a really slow process, I think. And, and I, I just find it, it's been, I find it distressing listening to everybody having a point of view about this. And what would I know? This is not a world I understand. But young people are so embracing of this. And you've talked about your children. Th their difference, their, you know, their, their gender fluidity, it's not an issue for them. Why on earth are we banging on constantly about an issue that should never be raised and a problem? And I understand what Tanya was saying about, you know, that, that this is... No one should be discriminated for whatever they are. Well, as we may enjoy and think we sh should shine a spotlight on, on some so topics, mm. it is really, really harmful. And we know, from what I understand, and I'm no expert, suicides raise, uh, rise every time this kind of debate occurs okay. because it's trying to, it's, it sends the message that you're still not acceptable in today's society. Let's go to our next question. It's a video question and it comes from Mick Scarcella. We have waited 234 years to have a voice in Parliament, and yet the Indigenous voice to Parliament will be decided by non-Indigenous people. There will only be an expectation for consultation where it is deemed that proposed laws would significantly impact Indigenous peoples. Who decides this? Self-determination is a basic human right under the Charter 3 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Why do we still have non-Aboriginal people making decisions for us? Tom Kelmer. Yeah, well, it's an important question, and I, and I think this this is if it goes down to a referendum where you have to have the majority of people in the majority of states uh, vote in favour, and and uh, because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people represent less than four percent of the population, yes, the the majority will be non-Indigenous people. But that's taking it down the route of of constitutional change and and uh, embedding the voice in in there. And, and this uh, is not going to be that, is it? At this stage, it's not. The government has said that they will go down the, the route of um, legislation and uh, uh, they've accepted the final report that, that the group that uh, Professor Marcy Langton and I uh, co-chaired. Uh, and, and that was 50, uh, 51 uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and non-Indigenous Australians all working together on a co-design process with the... Um, uh, with the government, mm. as well as a whole range of community consultations. And so that is... And, we, and we've taken the viewpoint from uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to guide us out in the community. And, and we've had, you know, over 9,000 people participate in, in this process. And so it is really enacting self-determination in that we've been pretty, um, you know, true to what, what we heard during the consultations. We've taken note of the, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We've looked at what uh, all the other representative bodies that have gone before and, and some of the reasons why they succeeded or didn't succeed. And, um, and so what we're proposing now is a two-tiered structure of uh, a local and regional structure as well as a national structure. Uh, the government said in the first instance, and, uh, and we actually put this in our report, that we should we should uh, uh, firstly look at the local and regional structure mm. and that's going to require working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the community level as well as with the, the, the local government and the state or territory government. Uh, so we can go through a co-design process and, and being led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that's the big difference. It's, it's moving away from having governments make a decision about what's best for us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or any peoples of Australia, you know, that shouldn't be the role of government. We should be party to those decisions. And, and that's what we're endeavouring to do. Um, and, you know, and we've had the support of, of the Prime Minister and, and led by 
can wire it through that. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, look, the, the next phase is, is going to kick off pretty shortly and, um, and we hope that, that that is seen as a real expression of self-determination. Um, can, I, can I just ask you, I mean, the, the Labor... I'll come to you in a second, Tanya Plibersek, about this, but the Labor Party has a slightly different offering, if you like, on this. Are, are you attracted to what Labor's offering in terms of a potential uh, recognition uh, in the Constitution? Um, look, I think at, down the track that will happen. Um, I think we need, just need to be really conscious that... But, uh, but, the... it, but you know that it can't... Or is it your feeling that it can't happen under this Prime Minister, under this government? No, no, it's, it's not to do with the, the Prime Minister or the government um, because in any, any referendum, you need to have both the major parties supporting, um, uh, you know, whatever the referendum's going to be. Of course, and but the process has to be kicked off, of course. It's got to be kicked off. And, and look, to the government's credit, they've, um, uh, they have put aside over $100 million uh, for a referendum in a future time, as well as money to go through a process of consultations that will be, uh, in the first instance, uh, you know, we believe it'll be embedded through legislation. Yep. And then when everybody is, is much more less fearful... Because we, we did take note of, you know, the, the transition in native title and how everybody was, you know, up in arms and, and, and you had the opponents saying you're going to lose your backyard... Well, they were, they were, they were scare campaigns, of course, Tom that, Palmer. And, and that's, what, that's what'll happen here. Um, we will get the scare campaigns up there. And we don't want to do what happened in 1999 with the uh, uh, referendum on the Republic, where we all thought it was going to yeah. get up and then, then it gets lost at the referendum. And 20-plus years later, yeah. it still hasn't re-emerged. We, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people... Many of us, and we heard this through our consultations, don't want to take that chance. We want to get it embedded okay. and then in the Constitution. I want to get to come to Tanya Plibersek before we lose her to COVID. So um, <laughs> go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Virginia. It's pretty simple. Labor supports the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full. We support voice, treaty and truth. And we think mm. uh, a voice to Parliament is really important. And... Uh, it's important because if you look at some of the big issues facing uh, First Nations Australians today, you know, 90,000 First Nations Australians haven't had their first dose of the COVID vaccine. Uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are saying that the National Plan on Violence Against Women and Children, uh, as it's drafted now, won't meet their needs. There should be a, a separate plan that is specific to First Nations communities. These kind of big issues are best... Um, are best led by and designed by uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians themselves. And I think a voice to parliament would be a, a super important first step in, in doing that effectively. Um, I, I want to actually just say one more thing. Tom Karma, Professor Langton, there are so many people who have dedicated their lives to giving a, a voice to First Nations Australians and to... Uh, empowerment and, um, uh, you know, shown just incredible leadership, often at great personal cost. And I, I, here's a shout-out to you, Tom, and, and to Thank Marsha you. as well, and to all of those who've done that for a lifetime. Thank you. Uh, mm. Katie Allen, can I just come to you on this? I mean, Tom Cummer referenced the scare campaign that came with Native Title. How does... Uh, your government, any government really, but yours in particular, prepare the ground for there to be a reasonable and calm national conversation that accepts the need, the importance of enshrining Indigenous rights, either in our constitution or somehow in a voice mm. to parliament? Yeah, look, I hear your sort of concerns, Virginia, and some people say that our side of government should be the one to do it because that will main, make sure that it, you know, it's corralled in the right direction. But I think we've made some really significant um, steps forward. With Tom and Marcia leading it, mm. it's been absolutely fantastic. I'm on one of the Indigenous um, recognition working groups, bipartisan working groups in Parliament. There's a real sense of a need for change, uh, particularly the closing the gap. Um, and there's, there's definitely a co-design approach, a grassroots approach. And the Prime Minister, who has said, you know, a strong country is a country at peace with its past, uh, he has... He, this is one of his big passion projects, actually. He's been very good on this air, in this area. Um, and Tom and Marcia have been great leaders taking this forward. But I do think we should also mention, you know, Australia's first Indigenous Australian, for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt. He is... He's a rock star. He's been absolutely fantastic at what he does. And he came out to Higgins last Friday. He's such a gentle, kind of wise Indigenous leader. And he, he just brings that calmness to the whole debate. And I think everyone wants this to work. 
And that's what's, I think, changing because it's a grassroots co-design. Instead of governments doing things to Indigenous people, it's working with and it's really being led by Indigenous Australians, and that's so incredibly important. Which is an, an echo of what Dylan's been talking about, you know, nothing about us without us, and we've yes. got some questions on that now. Our next question comes from Joshua Coston. I'm a business owner in the construction industry. A year ago, we had someone trial with us with a disability. We had to let him go to the fact that we just simply didn't have enough resources to, put, to be taken up. I still feel guilty about letting him go. People with disabilities have really good qualities, but due to the financial ramifications of the extra resources, we just couldn't make it work. My question is, what, if any, incentives are there financially to employ people with disability, and does not more need to be done in this area? Mate, thanks so much for your question. Thanks for being honest as well about what happened, first and foremost. I really appreciate that. Look, man, I've got three things that I want to achieve as Australian of the Year, um, you know, to try and better the, the, the life of people with disability. First and foremost, it is to have a fully funded, guaranteed, but most importantly, demand-driven NDIS. So people with disability can get what they need so they can go out and be the people they want to be. I'd love both sides of parliament to guarantee that before the election because people forget it's actually an investment in people with disabilities so they can get the resources, Josh, so they can get out there and live their lives. Um, you know, for every dollar spent on the NDIS, $2.25 goes back into the economy, like at your workplace, for example. $52 billion dollars um, was generated last year because of the NDIS. Like, it's a no-brainer to me. But unfortunately, so pop, people talk about the fact that it is expensive, and that makes it hard for us. And it's, it's not so I can buy a nice... People can buy a nice car. It's so people with disability can have a shower every morning. Mm. So young kids with disability, high-level disabilities, don't have to, don't have to live in, in nursing homes or aged care facilities, you know? And that breaks my heart when I hear things like that, and it's important. And the NDIS actually helps get people the skills so they can get out there and work better for people like you. Secondly, as we start opening up, um, and, you know, I'm so excited that we are opening for, up for this, but for people with disability to be able to go out and get a job, they've got to get the PPE and the free rat tests and the vaccine so they are protected so they can get out there and start being the people they want to be. But more important than that, there are people that are currently at home who won't go outside because they might die. Mm, yeah. Like, people are dying. And that, look, I get a, it. When I get told they're going to get two rat tests for their family a week, it's like get them whatever they need, so they can do what they want to do. It's not hard, yeah. You would agree with that. Yeah. I think everybody yeah. would agree with that, you know. And thirdly, as you're talking about, which is something that I've been passionate about for a while, mate, is more employment opportunities for yeah. for people with disabilities. Josh, let me come back to you. So, what would have helped in that situation? I mean, I get you're busy and everyone's flat out and you'd like to, to help this, this new guy. Yeah, so in our case, it would have taken probably two people to help get them going and train them up. So probably some financial incentive up front without having to wait four to six months for incentives to come through. Right, so some money to come through so you could um, hire, take on two so more people. So that would go, come in for us, go directly to someone else's wage. Yeah. yeah. Straight look, up. And that's the whole... Look, the, there's four and a half million people, like me, Joshua, with a disability in this country. Only 54% of them are were involved in the workforce, right? Yeah. I'm 31 years old. That participation rate has not moved in 31 years. I think yeah. if we want to improve the quality of life for people with disability, employment would be a huge factor. But also, it's not just the fact that the, the quality of life, not just for the remuneration, but how good's having a job? You've got yeah. mates, yeah? You get out, you get fit, you start living your life. I'm so lucky that I've got a job, right? And, and I employ people with disabilities and that. But it can be easily fixed, man. There's a bunch of things we can do. And you know what? Already doing things with, with government and, and already talked to Tanya and both sides of parliament are trying to help this thing, but it's easy. First and for foremost, government, corporates and, most importantly, C-suite and managers have got to leave their unconscious bias at the door, yeah. like you did, and give people with disability a chance. But there's got to be more funding streams so you can get the support that you need. Things like quotas work really well. Things like training programs. And I think, look... There is a new national disability strategy that's about to come out, and um, there's a big, big part of this, right? Because people with disability as well, we often just give given a job at the front or whatever that is, right? And we, we love that. But why can't we have a career? Mm. Why can't we talk about this stuff at school? You know, and I think it's really important. And I, you talking about it changes that for people. So let me go to another question, because I want to bring in another part of this, uh, this whole discussion here. And it comes from Bridget Brinkley. Uh, hi, Dylan. Um, I'm a mum of a five-year-old with cerebral palsy. He is amazing. Um, and I just wanted to firstly say thank you for all the work that you do um, for people with disabilities in this country. Um, I really hope that 
we can all use the momentum that you've kind of started uh, to build on that, um, which does tie into my question. Um, I also work, work in human resources um, and I'm just after some suggestions as to ways that both businesses and the government um, and what they can do to enable people with a, a disability to, to join or rejoin the workforce. Um, and if there are such um, big barriers to this, how do we remove them? Yeah, look, this is what I, you know, outside of being a semi-okay tennis player sometimes, um, this is what, I, this is what I, I love to talk about. And, and look, you know, through my foundation, I've got a consulting firm called GSA where we hire 50 consultants. And guess what? Every single one of them has a disability. Because if you want to find out about somebody, anything about anybody, the best way to do it is through lived experience. Same as what Tom was talking about before, which Rosie, we were talking about um, before as well. It's so important. And if you want to speak about somebody at a table, well, they need a seat at that table because they can explain what they need. And I think the biggest thing that we have to change is lift your expectations of what people think we can do as people with disability, because it's always more than you think, and leave the negative stigmas and, and negative perceptions and that unconscious bias that mm -hmm. has been given to us from generations mm -hmm. and generations of people not thinking that we can do it. Leave that at the door and challenge that and give us the opportunity. I mean, there are studies out there that show people with disability are more productive than able-bodied people in a job, have uh, higher retention rates and lower absenteeism than able-bodied people. Yeah, we can't get a gig. You know what I mean? Let so me, let, let me um, bring in uh, Tanya and Rosie in a second, but just quickly, if I come back to you, Bridget, because, I mean, you're, you're raising up the boy who hopefully can be employed by you at some point, Josh, as well. I guess you've had to lift your expectations of your five-year-old boy as well and, I guess, be pleasantly surprised by what he could do as opposed to living in fear about what he couldn't do, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's amazing if you just open your eyes how mm. capable mm. people are and you just don't see it. And I was just going to say, it's not me, by the way. It's we. Like, it, I'm telling you. Like, I am just being me. Like, and I don't speak for all disabled people and all the people that came before me so I could be Australian of the Year. It's not me, I'm telling you. And I think it's you telling your story and telling people it's the best way to change it. And that annoying glass ceiling now has an elevator through it that we can all bloody smash through <laughs> and start doing what we want to do. Tom, let me come to you because there, there are... <laughs> there are echoes in this conversation of the challenges around Indigenous employment, where um, an Indigenous person might come to a workplace and where there's a context. There's a context of education or social uh, pressures or trauma that needs to be understood and accounted for within that employment sector. So w what are the lessons? What, what can you sort of pay back here that maybe has been learnt in Indigenous employment? Well, yeah, look, I think we're still learning, um, you know, and, and disability uh, is another dimension that uh, we're very challenged with. And uh, depends upon where you're located um, and the availability of services, support services, um, that you can get access yeah. to. Uh, NDIS is, you know, is OK. It does provide support. But, boy, if you try to just apply for, you know, NDIS support, that, that requires a degree to be able to fill out the form. Well said. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and do it. So that's a, a real challenge. So, you know, what, what I think, and, and this is what excites me about what Dylan's going to be able to do um, this year is really raise that, that attention and during his travels around the nation. Now, I, I, I speak from a, the experience of our son who works uh, in the disability sector. He's an executive in, in an NGO. And, and they're the issues that confront, even in Sydney, um, you know, the, the uh, availability of NDIS services and providers, uh, getting the administrative support uh, for... NGOs to be mm. able to provide those services. Uh, you know, the lack of, of skilled um, people who can, who can le leverage that support if, if that's needed or creating the opportunities. You know, I remember one of the, one of the programs we supported um, uh, th some years ago was, was uh, uh, a, a very small operation called um, uh, Rainbow Bridge, I think it was, and, and that was about creating an opportunity for people with disability to be able to socialise, to be able to come into a safe environment uh, to meet other people and to develop the relationships um, that they need to have. Because, you know, as simple as that, has not been available. So, so there's still a tonne of work to do. Uh, all the best, Dylan, and, uh, you know, we'll stand with you <laughs> Thanks, in mate. this process. Uh, but we need to do it.
Uh, Rosie, the pace of change can be very, very slow. I mean, this is mm -hmm. something... And um, Dylan's just going to have everything before him this year, but as Australian of the Year, you would have seen... And probably, were you disheartened by how slow the pace of change can be when you're trying to push it forward with the platform that you had? Look, I think... Um Certainly when I first came, you know, I was thrust into to, to, to an advocacy role because of the murder of my son, um, you, you, you have no idea mm. how difficult change is um, and how slow it does make. And, and so... You want people to understand and get it right now and just act. But it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Ultimately, it starts with awareness and an appreciation and, and the conversations you have and those change. And, but as Katie was saying, when you look back to where we've come from, you realise change is always happening. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are, in, there are certain times, um, and, and, and this is a, a poignant period of time with Grace and Brittany and what they've been able to do this year, which is another watershed moment of time. And I think that's for all of us then to actually really push and really not let people off the hook mm. and really start... Because we are all part, part of change. It doesn't just happen by everybody else. It's We're all part of this. So um, change is difficult, it is slow, it's not fast enough for people, particularly if people in violent situations and, and in fear of their lives, it is not happening quickly enough. But the reality is change does take time. And I was just going to add, I think one thing that's really important with change is, and one thing like the three things that I'm talking about, they're actually tangible, mm. right? And mm -hmm. the time for words... Are over. Well, let me get to some tangibles then, just very briefly if I can, because I do want to hear from Tanya Plibersek and Katie Allen on this. Listening to this conversation, and notwithstanding the policies that you may have in place right now, does this uh, create in your mind an idea? Is there an idea you can share with us listening to what Joshua was saying, what Bridget, what uh, Dylan's saying that might help here? Katie Allen? Well, um, you know, I'm a paediatrician by training and I know that um, kids with disability um, need to get to school and there's often, you know, so many medical appointments that they need yeah. to go to. They often miss school. They kind of fall through the hoops and therefore they start lagging behind with their educational I think there's support. a misconception that we get a lot of medical appointments. For a lot of kids as well, like I'm serious, and I get that all the time. I went to uni, and the uni professor said, "Mate, I understand you're not going to be here to go to go to hospital." I go, "Mate, I'm fitter than you." No, I no, like, no. Like, <laughs> no, no. I know for a lot of people with disability, that yeah. is the case. Yeah, like I, I'm sorry, I looked after people like that. Yeah, so I'm know, just this might be a small group of people, and this is the thing about disability. It's so wide. So there are some but people with disability who don't go and see a doctor at yeah, all. Sure, right. but how are you and linking this to employment, Katie? So, well, the thing is that it depends on what is, you know holding you back from, mm. you know, getting your employment. So it might be that you've lagged behind your educational attainment or your training or whatever. So yeah, but if they won't if you've got a great degree and they won't employ yeah, you anyway... Yeah, we're ready to go. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of people with disability who are ready to kick ass, if I'm going to be honest, but I think it's more a problem where the opportunities let, are. Let me go to um, uh, uh, Tanya Pubasek. What do you got? Uh, oh, oh, so much. Um, Dylan and his organisation have done such great work directly with employers going into workplaces and challenging employers' misconceptions uh, about um, employing people with disability. And uh, I've worked with an organisation called Job Support since I was at uni. They have placed mm. thousands of people in open employment. They do amazing work. I've seen the way they've changed lives. The and and if, if, they wanted to jump in, if, if they went into Josh's workplace, what would they have done that might have made it possible for Joshua to keep that, that person? They, they would have had a one-on-one -on -one trainer with the person for however long it took to get that mm. person up to skill on that job. And then that trainer would be checking in every month, every six weeks, every six months, depending on the needs of the client and the um, employer. Okay. If there are any difficulties, change in role, they help the person work out how to get to work on public transport. There's all that sort of support, very practical support. All right, well, let, 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 let me get yeah, this. Very, very quickly, if you can, yeah. Yeah, very quickly. This is exactly what the National Disability Insurance Scheme was set up to do. Mm -hmm. And in recent weeks and months, we have heard of people having their, their packages halved mm. for, for, with no explanation as to why. We've got a Nas National Disability Insurance Agency that spent about $800 $50 million on outsourcing work, $85 million on contractors, $55 million on legal fees, and yet they tell us that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is unaffordable. It's not that it's unaffordable, it's be, it is that it is being trashed by a government that doesn't understand its essential purpose, which is to give autonomy and choice to people with disability. Let me give a right reply to Katie Allen there. I mean, the, uh, uh, Dylan wants it fully funded, uh, uh, a Demand guarantee driven. from both Demand of you. Demand-driven, fully Demand funded. Driven. Look, yes. it, look, actually, that is the intention of it. And, and you know, this um, the, there's 
I think 30 to 40 per cent more people who've got onto the NDIS than was anticipated. So that's kind of what, what the concerns are about, you know, is it going to be sustainable? But I think at the end of the day, the issue about the NDIS is the concepts are right and some of the translation of it actually happening, rubber hitting the roads, not working quite well. And there's a lot of moving parts, including um, the providers in all of this. So there are complications. It's not perfect at the moment, but... Um, and to give credit to Bill Shorten, it is actually, you know, an amazing um, scheme, National D Disability Insurance Scheme. It empowers um, people with disability to choose how, um, you know, they get the things that they need. Um, but there are some teething problems that, you know, it's one of the biggest social programs that's sure. been actually rolled out. And we okay. need to make it work. Australia needs to make it work. Josh, do you want us to hook you up with um, Dylan? Yeah, that's Chad, brother. Yeah, I've, got a, I've got a freebie for everyone as well. The best way to get change... <laughs> is through representation. On our screens, in our mainstream schools, mm. in our bars, on our dating apps, on our aeroplanes, in our pubs, at our sporting fields, on TV, on Q&A. Like, I'm telling you, that's the best way to get any social change and we need more people with disability getting the opportunities yeah. that I've been lucky enough to get and that's my job, is to amplify those voices. Josh Bridget, thanks for your questions, thank you. Our next question comes from Joanna Maidment. My question's for Dylan. And oh, it's about, it's, about, it's about his date <laughs> in Chadstown. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, what can we do to show that people with disability are passionate, flamboyant and capable of intimacy just like anybody else? How can we break down the barriers that people with disability face when it comes to romantic and sexual relationships going back to your Chadstown date? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. So my... Um, Beautiful partner, Chantelle, is a sexologist, a doctor of sex. So this is what she does. So I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, clearly. Um, I didn't want to say, but yeah. Um, I'm going to be upfront because I'm always me. This is the thing I struggle with the most mm. in my life. Like, I cannot tell you how much I used to hate myself. And what was I most worried about? This. Like, it, look, I still get goosebumps thinking about it and how lucky I am, to be honest. Because I know so many with people, like, what's the best part of your lives, your relationship and your children and things. And so many people with disability get left out because people think we can't have sex, we can't have kids, they look different. What's the point? Well, you Dylan, I mean? we can't all partner up with a sexologist. I know, so, I'm not saying that. So, so what's the solution? The solution to that is, well, it's twofold. First and foremost, anybody can have sex or be in a relationship in any way that they can have sex or be in a relationship, right? It's not the same as you or you or anyone. No one, I'm sure, no one does it the same way. <laughs> but it's different for everybody and that's OK, you know what I mean? But... My advice is to any non-disabled person, if you see a good-looking person that with one arm, who's autistic, in a wheelchair, whatever, go up and say good day. You know what I mean? Like, why would you not do that? But the only way that we change these things is to talk about it. And, like, every time me and Chantel talk about it, there will be a Daily Mail article tomorrow. Dylan Orcott talking about his sex life with his sex life. <laughs> like, I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? And, and I'm, I'm not saying that's how it's going to be for everybody, but <laughs> what I will say is I'm lucky that I have had to do that, and I want more people, disability or not, to get to experience that, for sure. Breaking down the barriers. Yeah, but yeah. Before, just before we move on, though, I wanted to ask you, because I know you mentioned in your Australia Day speech how you wanted to elevate the profile and the understanding of invisible disabilities. Yeah. Mm. And uh, that gets us, of course, to the neurodiverse as well, mm. who um, have an extraordinarily difficult life, because when you see someone in a wheelchair, even if you have a prejudice, at least there it is. I can understand that. And, you know, many people are just immediately regarded as heroes because they're in a wheelchair. Yeah. When you're neurodiverse, when you have behavioural challenges, mm -hmm. when you behave in a way that, that um, neurotypical people see as immediately bad behaviour, and unacceptable. How are you going to turn that prejudice around? Yeah, look, and it's not their fault, and that's that's what breaks my heart. Look, first and foremost, when I become Australian of the Year, all the articles, the first disabled Australian of the Year, Grace Tame's autistic. Like, she openly said that she's on the spectrum. So I'm not, first and foremost, and there's probably heaps of Australian of the Year's came before me <coughs> that might have a disability that didn't want to tell anyone, because when mm -hmm. you do, you get discriminated against straight away, or you get treated differently. And I agree, unless I put some kind of trench coat around my wheelchair, it's pretty hard to not <laughs> tell that I'm not, not disabled. And I want to elevate the voices of non-physical disabilities as well because they often have it the hardest. Like, only 4% of people in Australia that are disabled uh, are in a wheelchair, of the, oh, sorry, of the 20%. So it's like, it's not a big number. Yeah, there's way more disabilities out there and that's my job. And you know what? People go, what's it like to be autistic, like you just said? I don't know, because I don't have autism. I'm not on the spectrum. But do you know who does? Mm people who are on the spectrum. And that's my job, is to elevate the voices of all people with a varying way of disabilities so they can tell you what they need. Because it's not my job to, or 
position to do that. I want them to be able to tell it. And that's why there needs to be more representation everywhere so they can. Well, I knew this conversation would fly, and so it has tonight. We're up to our final question, and it comes from Alison Champion. I'm a retired, fairly conservative person who is now incredibly disillusioned by the state of affairs, lack of action and leadership in Australia. I'd like to believe that most people go into politics hoping to make a difference. How do you maintain your individual ideals and integrity as a member of a major political party or in public life? Tanya Plibersek, and thank you for being here tonight when I know you've got a household of, of, of COVID and you're not feeling well yourself, but how would you answer that question? Well, I, I think um, Dylan has spoken a lot tonight about being authentically yourself, and that's what people look for in politics as well. They don't mind disagreeing with you. What they don't want is someone, um, if I can use this language, it's not children's viewing times, they don't want to be bullshitted by people. So I think leadership is about service. It's about having a vision for the future of the nation and the ability to persuade people to come along with you on that journey. I think one of the reasons that people love Jacinda Ardern so much um, around the world, people responded to uh, her hug after um, the, the terrible massacre in New Zealand. What they saw was a human being being herself and that... Leadership can be about kindness and empathy, um, looking someone in the face, holding their hand, going on a journey with them. Uh, I think that's what people are really craving from leaders at the moment. So much of politics at the moment is about mm. sport and biff and, and conflict. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way um, uh, about politics today. I know a lot of people feel that way about politics today. Uh, we do need to do better because when we do better, we attract more and better people to political life as well. Rosie Batty, how would you answer that question? I mean, you had leadership thrust upon you in the most awful way. Look, I think, um, as Tanya is saying, you know, you, you authentic yourself, you keep your integrity. Um, and what does that mean, keeping your integrity? Being true to yourself. I mean, sometimes you may not agree or like the things that are happening, but how can you, um, what can you do about that? How can you contribute in a way that you can sit with yourself and know that you did the best in that situation and you were the best person you could be? And often you fail yourself in, and, and, and always think you could have been better. Mm. But ultimately, I think striving to, to be that better person, to be the person, as, as Tony was saying, that, that can be the kind person, the compassionate person, the caring person, um, and strong when you need to be. And, and I think that, um, and vulnerable, you know, we're, we're not all ways, um, we, we can be strong and vulnerable at the same mm. time. But I think um, there are a lot of good politicians, and I've met a lot of people who are very, very passionate and believe in what they do, but it's very, easy, I think, to get, um, to see a lot of the negativity and be drawn into a lot of that um, behaviour. And, well, and it is quite... Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think, Katie Allen, your experience of the last 24 hours and crossing the floor is maybe an example of that. Is it getting harder and harder for you to, to reconcile being a member of a party, this particular party, with your own personal ideals? Not at all. I mean, actually, I feel you know, empowered to be who I need to be. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, people go into politics or into leadership because they want to help others. That's, that's fundamentally mm. why they do it. Um, and having humility about that is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, leadership's a complicated thing. You know, it, it's not a one size fits all. And I think it's also a journey. I don't think people are made immediately as leaders. I think they grow into the roles that either are thrust upon them or they manage to, you know, find themselves in the right place at the right time. Um, and so it's complicated. And there's not this sort of Hollywood version that this is the perfect leader. 
Uh, you've, are you ruling out a tilt at politics? You floated that once, Dylan. Geez, after this week, bloody oath, it looked like <laughs> looked horrible. Um, I thought about it. Well, maybe you can have more change outside. I'll never say never, though. OK, um, so you're not saying they're not ruling it out. No, so not, for, not for a long, still long time. Still got the baton in the backpack, long as they time, say. Long All right. time, long okay. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Tom, your reflections on, on leadership and, 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 and being true to your ideals when you have to, as you know probably better than anyone on this panel, how mm. hard it is to achieve change. Uh, look, it is. And, and can I just um, recognise um, Katie and, and uh, the other members who crossed the floor? Because any politician who crosses the floor, you know, um, and particularly if you do it as an individual, uh, you could be in the abyss for years. And, uh, and I recall the way uh, Philip Ruddock was treated when he crossed the floor on an Indigenous issue uh, many, many years ago um, and took a long while to get back in. But I think leadership is is something that... And, and particularly with politicians who need to get a lot more exposure before joining politics uh, in, in the real world, as we say. Yeah. And, and, um, and I think that's, that's the important bit. Uh, they've got to be able to hear what people say. Some of the big movements that are around at the moment, uh, the good ones, um, uh, you know, like, like The Voice, like uh, what, what Grace is... Uh, mm. uh, and the, the women's movements are, are fantastic and they can guide. Now, can I just do a quick promotion? There's, I think, three three good programs out there. One is the Atlantic Philanthropy mm. uh, for Social Change program, uh, open for everybody to apply for it. Um, also, we've got the Churchill Fellowships that yep. are open and they close um, in, in April. But I think one of the things that I'd like the, the audience to keep an eye on is the McKinnon Prize. And um, mm. it's not well known, but the McKinnon Prize is uh, every year when, when a group of... Uh, of individuals, it's a bipartisan award, and they will judge politicians uh, from the, the the Australian government, uh, the state and territory government, and and the local government uh, who have who have done done good for the community. People who have been able to show courage, uh, leadership, uh, been able to have great ethical behaviour, um, you know, and 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 impact. And I think, you know, there's, uh, okay. there's some great candidates this year. But keep your eye on the McKinnon Prize, folks. That's going to happen before the end of this month. Eye on the prize and also some things that you can apply for yourselves if you've got the leadership aspiration too. A great panel. That's all we have time for. So please, thanks to our panel, Katie Allen, Rosie Batty, Dylan Alcott, and it's Sydney, Tom Kalmer and Tanya Plibersek. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for all of your questions as well. They were terrific. Next week, Stan Grant will be with you live from Sydney, looking at why some voters are feeling left behind by the major parties. He'll be joined by Liberal MP Dave Sharma, his independent challenger, Allegra Spender, and Chris Bowen. And you can join me tomorrow morning on ABC Radio Melbourne. So stay safe, good night, and go well.